So welcome back. It looked like there was some great information sharing going on in the exhibit hall. And uh, please, again, do take advantage of all those uh, people with wonderful knowledge out there at our next break. But I'm really pleased to move things along and introduce our second plenary speaker, Dr. Alex Rajput. Dr. Rajput is a professor in the Division of Neurology, Department of Medicine, University of Saskatchewan. He's the director of the Movement Disorder Frozen Brain Studies Laboratory and the director of the Movement Disorders Program at the University of Saskatchewan. And um, I, I know we've tried to get a brain bank going here and it just hasn't taken off, but there is a wonderful brain bank that uh, Dr. Rajput uh, is in charge of in Saskatchewan. He is currently a member of the editorial board for both the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences and Parkinsonism and Related Disorders, and he also reviews articles for neurology and movement disorders. His outpatient practice focuses on Parkinson's disease, tremor, dystonia, and other movement disorders, and he received the Vol Award for Teaching Excellence in 2013 as voted by his neurology residents. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rajput. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Th thank you for that very kind introduction. This is a spectacular turnout. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Carolyn and Stacy for their help and the rest of the organizing committee. Uh, I do tend to be a little bit soft-spoken, so I'll try and lean a little bit more without quite getting my, my face into the, the microphone here. So you've had two fantastic uh, opening speakers. I hope I can hold up my end of the bargain. I'm here to talk to you about motor symptoms, and if you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, by virtue you have motor symptoms, so a lot of you will be more familiar with some of these symptoms uh, than I am because you're, you're dealing with it on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so the objectives for this presentation, firstly, to review the motor symptoms and how to evaluate them. Uh, secondly, to discuss some treatment strategies, including references to the most recent uh, guide, Canadian guideline for Parkinson's disease, and that just came out in the CMAJ or Canadian Medical Association Journal in September 2019. And briefly to discuss the Saskatchewan Movement Disorders Program, including the role of clinical pathologic studies and research. And there'll be time at the end for some questions. Uh, full disclosures, I'm a movement disorders neurologist. I'm a clinician. I see patients regularly. I'm not a basic scientist. I'm not a neurosurgeon. So any hard questions about DBS, I'll ask you to defer to your uh, your local neurosurgeon for that. Some of what I'll discuss is my personal views, which may differ from the published guidelines. Uh, I have received research support from a Dr. Ali Rajput Endowment for Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders that's kindly managed by the RUH Foundation, and I'm a co-investigator on a grant funded by Parkinson Canada. Uh, Parkinson's has been around for a while and is diagnosed, or noted even 10th, 12th uh, century BC, but it didn't really get its name until James Parkinson reported in his essay on a shaking palsy, this quote here, involuntary tremulous motion with less than muscular power and parts not in action and even when supported, so alluding to the resting tremor there, with a propensity to bend the trunk forward, talking about a flexed posture, and to pass from a walking to a running pace. He's talking about the propulsion that many of you are familiar with. The sense of intellect being uninjured. Uh, as we know from our previous speaker, that's not necessarily the case, but in terms of uh, diagnosing what you can see, um, he, he, was, he was pretty spot on with that. Uh, he reported this on six cases. I think he examined only one of them in significant detail. Uh, there's no photo available, actually, of, of him. I tried, I gave a presentation uh, in Winnipeg earlier this year, and I thought, let's talk about the history, and is there something on James Parkinson? And the first photograph didn't appear until 1826. Um, so I, and I couldn't find any lithographs or anything else with him. Uh, this man had multiple interests, as Dr. Mapstone alluded to. He, they did multiple things at the time. You weren't just a physician, you're a surgeon, apothecary, but he was also a bit of a rabble rouser, medical writer, advocate for the underprivileged, and outspoken critic of the government, uh, amateur chemist, and best, he's actually best known for his work in geology and paleontology. And those are his books. It was quite impressive. So that, that's what he was known for primarily in his lifetime. Now we know him as uh, describing Parkinson's disease. Um, 
Uh, and as the uh, two speakers before had uh, mentioned, and as you're familiar with, this is a common condition, unfortunately. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease affecting humans. It's after Alzheimer's disease. And depending on which uh, article you read, it's 1% of either of those age, 60 above or 65 and above. Almost all the studies show a male preponderance. I'm not sure the reason for that, but it typically is about a three to two ratio of uh, men to women. Uh, I've pulled up the Canadian census data from 2016. I mean, those numbers have gone up by now, but almost 1.2 million ages, 60 and above living in British Columbia. So we're looking at about 12,000 persons in the province of Parkinson's, I think. Uh, Doug had mentioned 9,000. So anywhere, nine to 12,000, a significant number of people affected with Parkinson's. And the other thing that we know with Parkinson's is it's not just someone has a broken arm and they've got pneumonia, it's a ripple effect. It's their, it's their family, uh, their friends, their coworkers. It has a significant, uh, significant impact. Uh, and there was a recent uh, meeting in Nice, France. I didn't, I didn't go to the Riviera, I was back in Saskatoon. Uh, but a very well-known uh, neurologist, and neuroepidemiologist, by the name of Carly Tanner, reported this was sort of late-breaking news, and it came up in the news flashes that come out, looking at the annual cost, and Dr. Mapstone mentioned this as well, about $2.5 billion for direct and about $2.5 billion indirect. This is a U.S. study, so they have a, over $50 billion. And they suspect that's probably an underestimate. So it's a very significant um, monetary issue as well. Um, so in terms of the cardinal features, uh, I tell students and the residents, uh, look for the three S's. People with Parkinson's are slow or have bradykinesia, uh, they're stiff or have rigidity, and they're shaky, and this is classically a resting tremor. To make a diagnosis, you need two out of these three. Uh, Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis. We can't send someone to the lab and say, your panel shows that you've got Parkinson's. You can't send them for a scan and say you've got Parkinson's. It takes time to interview someone and examine them. I didn't, for sake of time, I didn't put this in an extra slide, but Parkinsonian features are also very common as you get older. And there was a paper about 20 odd years ago showing the prevalence of Parkinsonian features increased from about 15 to 20% in those age 65 and above to over 50% in those age 85. That doesn't mean they all have Parkinson's disease, but they have Parkinsonian features. So when you're talking about early diagnosis, it becomes much easier for me to make a diagnosis than someone who's 45 or 50 and relatively good health, and maybe now they've developed slowness of stiffness, versus someone who's in their 80s, has had a previous stroke, has had arthritis, they're a little bit slow and stooped, and I have to use my internal reference to say, this is, more than what I can account for, or you know what, I'm just not sure right now, I'm going to keep an eye on you and see you again. So I'd love to be able to come up with a definitive diagnosis right away. Sometimes I just say, we'll wait. It's much more difficult to sort of walk back a diagnosis and say, you know what, I think you have something else. Uh, the other thing, when, they re when you look at the journals, especially the New England Journal, they have these clinical pathologic correlations, and they condense weeks, months, or years of data into a few paragraphs. It doesn't work like that in real life. And it, it's a sequential evolution for the last sort of penny to drop and say, uh-huh, this, uh, this is what someone has. Um, for Parkinson's, it's typically asymmetric. And this, the side of symptoms that you begin with tends to be worse as a rule. I looked at handedness just out of curiosity. And for whatever reason, even among, you know, accounting for left-handers and right-handers, it seems to be more common that you have symptoms on the right side. Again, I don't have an answer for, for why, why that is, but the studies have shown that it tends to be a little more common in terms of onset on, on the right side. Uh, bradykinesia literally means slow movements. Brady is a Greek or Latin word for slow. And this may encompass the terms akinesia, meaning total lack of movement. Bradykinesia meaning that there's a slowness of movement. Or hypokinesia, that there's a reduced amplitude of movement. And when you go to see your, your physician, they'll do different things. One of them will be the finger tap, and you tap up and down like this. You don't want to do it too long, because even in someone who's young and healthy, they'll fatigue. But you do it, ask them to do it about 10 or 15 times, and generally it's going to be slower. Um, and with time, it may fatigue. Sometimes it may be so impaired that they can't even separate the, the fingers. You'll do the pronation, supination. And for example, here you can see that I'm having a harder time moving my, my left side it becomes harder when both sides are equally 
uh, equally affected. Uh, and the hand opening and closing, at least in my experience, this tends to be relatively well preserved uh, when you get someone to flick their fingers open and close. Uh, in the lower limbs, you can do a heel tap, so they're seated, and I bring their heel up about three inches up and get them to tap, and you can hear that. Uh, with people with Parkinson's, it'll, and they may not be able to pick up their foot. There, are, there may be mechanical issues. People have had hip surgery, they have arthritis. That may not be the easiest thing for them to do, to do in which case you'll do the toe tap where the heel is on the ground. You get them to tap their toe up and down, and you get them to do that a few times comparing the right and the left side. And again, accounting for any other things that may limit the speed of movements. In terms of rigidity, you know, this is passive movement at a joint. Classically, you'll take the hand and kind of rotate it at the, at the wrist. You can also do it at the elbow, uh, just kind of flexion, extension. You can do it at the shoulders, but a lot of people have frozen shoulders and there are other mechanical issues, rotator cuff tears. I'll tend to do it at the wrist, but some people have a lot of tremor, and I'm not sure how much underlying tremor there is versus, their, versus the stiffness, in which case I'll go to the, the elbow. Uh, you can check it at the knees, and with some, you can do it with someone sitting down, and I just extend and flex the knee. When someone's lying down, again, I'll bring the leg up and down. If someone can't relax, it becomes harder to assess, and the physician makes their, their best judgment on, on that. Um, cogwheeling is a classic feeling. It's kind of a ratchety feel. And lead pipe is kind of a smooth increased tone. I liken it to putting a spoon in ice cream that's really frozen in your deep freeze, a kind of bendy, viscous feel. And in my experience, you get the cogwheeling more at the wrist, and you get the lead pipe a little more at, at the knees. I don't really feel much of a, a cogwheeling at the knees. It means the same thing. The basal ganglia is affected, and they have, and they have rigidity. Uh, talking about tremor in Parkinson's, about two-thirds of people have tremor as a presenting feature in Parkinson's. The classic tremor is what's called a resting tremor, which means a limb is fully supported against gravity. And I use that definition, but then I've taken that to the exam room, and that doesn't always, that doesn't always bear out. That'll get people to lie on the bed, and I see little to no tremor, with, but I know that they've got tremor. And then when I get them to sit up and their arms are positioned a certain way, they'll shake, or I get them to stand up. And standing up is actually a pretty good, pretty good way to test for tremor because there should be no anti-gravity muscles at play. You're standing, the hand will shake. Um, I don't think the pharmacists roll their pills anymore between their thumb and their forefinger, but that's what they used to call it. Uh, the frequency is four to six hertz, meaning that if you were to check the number of oscillations back and forth, it would be four to six times uh, per second. Uh, I asked the residents or the students, you know, take your watch and do it over five seconds, divide by five, because if you do it over one second, you're not going to figure that out. Some papers will say three to five hertz, but four to six hertz. And when you see it, you kind of know this is a Parkinsonian tremor. The tremor can affect the upper and the lower limbs. Uh, I don't know why in some people it's there at the hand, some people it's more a turning of the, the forearm. Uh, in the legs, it can be the foot going up and down, it can be the legs going back and forth. Uh, I presume it's however the, the, motor, the motor planning or sequencing is in that brain, but I see all those kinds of tremor in people. You can also have jaw tremor, you can have an up and down tremor or, or a side to side tremor. You can have a lip tremor and sometimes you can have a tongue tremor as well. Uh, but we know that resting tremor is not the only type of tremor observed in people with Parkinson's. I won't go into the details, but a fellow by the name of Deutschel, he's a very a uh, famous neurologist in Germany has particular interest in uh, tremor. I think he was an engineer in his previous, uh, previous life. Type 1 is a classic resting tremor that we see. Uh, type 2, he describes, a lot of people have a postural and or action tremor. So postural tremor means the hands are like this. And action tremor means when you're reaching out for something and the hand shakes. And those can be at a different frequency than resting tremor. And the type three are those with basically no resting tremor, but they'll have mostly a pure action or a tremor and or resting tremor with that. So you can see all types of tremor with uh, Parkinson's, but the classic one is going to be a resting tremor. And the other thing with medicine is with other parts of life, the closer you look at something, you, the more likely you are to see something that's just maybe not quite, not quite right. Uh, other motor features of Parkinson's, uh, micrographia, uh, people have smaller handwriting. Usually the banks can still cash the checks. But if, I mean, it's about that time of year when people are writing Christmas cards. They say, well, 
I make it through the first one or two and it just turns into a scrawl or, you know, I just send a mass email out, that's fine. Because everything is either with a computer or a phone for a number of people, I will ask them, how are you with texting? How are you with typing? And I'll say, well, I was always one finger, but now I'm kind of half a finger. I'm really slow with this or I double click on the mouse. I'm just not as coordinated dexterous. And that's, uh, that's acceptable. Um, hypophonia, they have a softer speech. Uh, I haven't heard of people with Parkinson's really having a louder speech. It may be a higher pitched. Uh, it may be lower pitched. It can be raspy. It can be a fascinating speech where they start talking, okay, and then they words run together, and it's very hard to understand. Or it can actually be slower, but it's, it's always softer. And the other thing is if you're getting that history, make sure it's from someone else who may be a little bit younger, at least has preserved hearing, because they'll come in and say, well, I don't hear so well, and whether it's because it's typically a couple have been married for 30, 40 years, they're just ignoring them, or the, or the spouse doesn't hear so well. And I say, well, when you're with your kids, your grandkids, can they understand you when you're out with your friends? Are they asking you to speak up? And if they're giving me that history, I know that, yes, there's been a change in terms of, in terms of their speech. Uh, Dr. Master, want to comment on the hypomimia, reduced facial expression. Uh, not many people I see play, play poker, but... They usually don't report uh, reduced facial expression. Sometimes they do, and people may mistake it for being angry. They're not necessarily angry, but that normal play of expression isn't there, and that's because of the basically hypoarachnesia with the facial muscles. They're just not moving as quickly. You tell them a joke, or I don't know any jokes, but I say I'm going to tell you a joke, and their face, they have a nice smile, but then it goes back to its uh, more, uh, more neutral position. And a number of people have gait and postural abnormalities. Uh, a gait and posture, uh, early on it may simply be reduced arm swing. They, they walk and are not swinging one arm quite as much as the other. Uh, as people age, the posture flexes. Uh, people with Parkinson's have an exaggerated flex posture. And a lot of them will have a scoliosis or tilt uh, to one side. And for whatever reason, about three quarters of people have a tilt away from uh, the side that's more slow and stiff. I don't have a good answer for that, but if you look, there's a paper in the 70s, and so it'll be flexed and kind of tilted. Uh, they'll have a slow shuffling gait. Uh, they may go from being, you know, I was a fast walker in the couple, now I'm a slow walker. Now I can hear when someone's coming because they're scuffing their feet. Uh, may have propulsion, and I've seen a few people where one of their first symptoms was I was at the grocery store and I had the cart, and they're going down the ramp, and then they went a little bit, uh, a little bit too fast. Uh, sometimes people have retropulsion. This will be like when they're getting out of a car, They'll tend to go backwards, or sometimes opening the fridge door, they'll have retropulsion. I don't see too much of that. It, it exists, but I see far more people that have the propulsion, the kind of flex gait and taking lots of short steps. And people may also have gait freezing, particularly as they're uh, getting onto an elevator or crossing a threshold, going through a door. They take shorter steps and they get stuck. And you can imagine that's quite bothersome. People are behind you, you want to move, and you're just stuck. You can't, you can't pick up your feet. Um, some of you have heard the terms Hohen and Yar staging. Your physician may, uh, your neurologist may send that to your, your family doctor. Uh, Hohen and Yar, a couple of uh, neurologists, and they devised a staging system in the 60s. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but it's a pretty good one. Uh, if someone's at stage one, they may have unilateral findings, meaning that there's findings just on one side of the body when you examine them. Stage two means that there are findings on both sides of the body but it doesn't necessarily tell you how severe they are. There's another scale, which some of you may be familiar with, called the UPDRS, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which I use for a lot of clinical trials. And at that one, they give you a score for each of these activities and then add it, add it up. It's like 108 point for the motors, and I think 170 odd for total. So someone can be at a mild stage two, they have a little bit of shaking, a little bit of slowness of stiffness uh, on the other side, or someone can have really severe shaking, slowness, and stiffness, but their balance is still preserved. They're still both at stage two, but obviously they're not at the same state in terms of how far their Parkinson's is. Stage three are people where their balance is uh, unstable, uh, and there may be history of spontaneous falls. Sometimes uh, people don't fall, but they use a walker because they're afraid of falling, but when I pull them, their balance is actually pretty good. So then I have a discordance saying on exam or stage two, but by history, they're at this stage because they're using this assistive device. So stage three will mean you get up, you don't need a cane, you don't need a walker. But when I give you a pull, 
you're taking four more steps, or some people take no steps, they'll just fall back. Uh, I usually give people a mulligan in the office because sometimes they're not quite sure how hard I, I pull them. If there's repeated posture imbalance, I know that that's, you know, that's for real. Um, stage four, these are people that get up and walk with a, with a walker or cane, but, they're, but they, can still, they can still do that without assistance. Uh, stage five, they're unfortunately stuck in a wheelchair or bed bound, or if they do get up, they're in a walker and they've got a support belt around, someone's holding on to them and they've got one or two people beside them. So yes, they can walk, but they're not really, they're not really that uh, independent. Most of the people I see are about at stage two. Uh, I like to keep them at stage two. Uh, depending on what time of day you examine someone, uh, their exam findings may change. And if they have very subtle findings, depending on if I'm saying that's within normal or, ab or it's abnormal, I may say, well, you're at stage one, or today you're at stage two because you have a mild finding on this side. It's not they've progressed dramatically, it's just that they have findings on, on both sides. And I, th I must have that another side. That's just a break here. Uh, just briefly, the biochemistry and pathology. Uh, there's a cell loss uh, in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is, well, that's the next one. Oh, 50% uh, loss of uh, cells or 50% loss of dopamine in the striatum. So when, when you go to the doctor and you say, I'm slow, I'm stiff, I'm not, you know, I'm not quite right, that process in the brain has been going on for a few years. But if you were to have seen someone you know, two or three years before, like, why am I seeing you? The physician say, I can't find anything, and come back. Now, it may be that you have some of these non-motor features and you've come in to see someone and they may say, yes, I acknowledge you have these symptoms, but I can't diagnose you with Parkinson's disease yet because you don't have these motor features. I expect uh, science and medicine would evolve that eventually you can intervene and do something in a sort of pre-motor uh, pre state. But right now it remains a motor diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and if you look at the brain, uh, people have loss of cells in the nigra and gliosis, and it's called a Lewy body. So this is the, hopefully I can, that's a substantia nigra, that's right there. And that projects to the caudate, and the caudate has more of a role in terms of emotion and, and thinking, and that's the putamen, and that has a primary role in terms of the motor function. And this is, a, this is just a gross pathology. This is what's called the midbrain. That's someone who died who did not have Parkinson's. Uh, substantia nigra literally means black substance in Latin. You can see that kind of black stripe on both sides. This is someone with Parkinson's disease, and you can see that very faint stripe there. So even grossly looking at the brain, once it's been cut, on the outside you can't really see much, but once it's been cut and you're looking there, uh, you can tell that this is affected. This is when you look under the microscope. You can see that there are lots of these melanin-containing cells and a number of cells there. Here there's a paucity or lack of cells and some gliosis. This is what's called the Lewy body, so it's kind of a, a halo and a dense core, and these little granules there, those are the melanin-containing containing granules. So I talked to you about what, uh, what the physicians look for. I'm gonna tell you what uh, people will report when they have Parkinson's. And, you know, Number you all of you would have experienced this, or either first hand or second hand. The hands shake, they're less coordinated, they have problems with fine tasks, buttons, zippers, pants, shoelaces, uh, and they feel weak. They're not necessarily weak in the classic sense that when you test their strength, you say, don't let me bend your arm down, or can you lift this, they're pretty good, but they feel weak because they're slow. And one of the classic things will be opening a jar. And to open a jar, you need to, you need to move it quickly. You have to develop that torque. And people with Parkinson's don't have that. They can't generate force quickly, so they're going to feel weak. So yeah, they can carry the 20 or 40 pound bag of potatoes, but they're not gonna be able to do something really, really quickly. With their legs, they may shuffle or scuff their feet. They're no longer the fast walk, or they, they hunch over. Um, and in general, just some of the daily things are a bit harder. It's harder to get out of a chair. They don't like the big comfy chairs or sofas. They need to move their, when you ask them to stand up, they kind of scooch their bum forward. Sometimes they have to rock, push off of the armrest or get someone to help them up. Uh, they've had to change their vehicle because a low riding one isn't, 
as good. They need something to step up on to get in and out. Problems putting our arms into sleeves, just those daily things. So the test that we do, I say that's fine, that's an objective test, but it doesn't tell me necessarily how well someone is, is doing it uh, at home. It's an okay surrogate, but most, of the, most people don't say, I'm coming to see you because I'm slower with this. They're coming to see you because they have problems doing these other activities, and these tests are sort of surrogate markers, but I'm going to listen to what they're, what they're telling me. The other thing is that everyone slows down as they, as they age, and when you're 40, you don't do things quite as well as when you're 20, when you're 60, not the same as 40, and certainly when you're 80, not quite as, uh, not quite as good. And when the calendar turns, you go from like uh, 75 to 77, there shouldn't be a big difference, provided that your, your overall health has been good. And if someone says, you know, now mom or dad or husband or wife is a lot, having a lot more difficulty, that tells me that it's not simply normal aging. There's something else going on. And when you're lacking dopamine, the automatic things aren't, uh, aren't so automatic. You can do them, but they're slower, clumsier, and, and more effortful. Uh, in terms of management of Parkinson's, unfortunately, we don't have a cure yet for it. However, uh, I try and be reasonable. I mean, there's a glass half empty, a glass half full. I say, well, you have Parkinson's. However, it's currently the only neurodegenerative disease for which we do have effective treatments, which is, which is good. So we say, and when they, when they leave the room, and I tell the residents, they leave different. You've given them a diagnosis. There's a lot, there's a lot for people to, to digest and and come up with. Some of them already have a pretty good idea. It's just confirming that, yes, they've had it, they've been on a medicine, but sometimes it's just out of the blue, and it takes, it takes a while for people to kind of wrap their heads around it, because it, it is a difficult diagnosis to, to receive. Uh, but I tell them that, yeah, there are things that we can, we can do to help you make your life easier. The goals are going to vary according to the individual and their symptoms and circumstances. So when I see someone who's 40 years old and I diagnose them with Parkinson's, they're at a different stage in their life and have different expectations than someone who's 60, or maybe they're more senior in their career looking at maybe I'll retire a little bit earlier or do some more traveling versus someone who's 80 and saying, well, those things that I needed to do when I was 40, I don't really, it doesn't really make much of a difference or isn't as important to me anymore. The goal is should be adequate function on the least medication possible. I tell people, don't expect all the symptoms to resolve and be as good as you once were. But you should be better than you are now. And then it comes to sort of a new, uh, a new baseline. There's sometimes when people say they have nothing, they feel great. On exam, they may have some subtle things, but I'm really happy when they tell me I'm, I'm, functioning, I'm functioning fine. Sometimes it takes a little tweaking to get them to, to that level. Uh, in terms of early Parkinson's, if you can still do everything at an acceptable level, and you're the only one that has to tell you, or that has to tell me that it's acceptable, you may decide not to treat. Uh, right now, we don't have any treatment that has a definitive neuroprotective effect, so that's okay. If they say I'm a little slow, I'm a little stiff, I can still do all my physical activity, I can still work. That's that's okay. Um, there's no harm if you don't treat someone immediately after the diagnosis, unless someone has significant. I should say, there's a caveat there, and there's someone who has significant slowness, they're falling, other problems, yes, you need to intervene, but mild early symptoms, if there's a delay of three or six months, someone has to be comfortable, because you all have the autonomy to choose what you're going to do. I can give you the best medical advice, but if I give you treatment that you don't like, you're not gonna take it, it's just, a, just as simple as that. Uh, there are people that are, uh, that are phobic of medication and say, well, I don't wanna take this, that's your choice, but you're potentially depriving them of the, of the benefit. So there's kind of a, a balancing act saying, yes, I will take it. And medication isn't the only part that they can do. It's an important part. Uh, but if I could tell people, you know, just do this mental exercise or do this physical exercise or do something else and you won't need medicine, I would do that. Lifestyle modification, for one, is hard. Uh, second, even if, some, even if everyone was motivated to do that, unfortunately, those are not enough. They're important, but they're not, they're not sufficient in and of themselves. Um, talk briefly about anticholinergics. Uh, the ones that are listed here, most common ones are benztropine and trihexaphenidol. Um, we call it sort of a 20% medicine. It helps 20% of the people about 20% of the time. Uh, anecdotally, it was thought to preferentially help people with a lot of tremor. There's no good medical evidence to support that. 
It may help people with symptoms of dystonia, meaning their hands are turned in or their feet is turned or twisted in. Uh, its use is limited because there are a number of adverse effects. You can get confusion, memory loss, dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention. So yeah, it can help. And there's some people I have that are on it and I wish that they weren't because they're having some of these issues, but when I take them off it or reduce it, then their motor symptoms get worse. So you're, you're, it's, it's a balancing act. So there has to be a, the goal of treatment should be you discuss with someone and say, yes, this is, this is an acceptable trade-off. Uh, and Canadian guidelines say you can use it, but not recommend as first line, uh, first line treatment, so grade B. And theory behind that is that in Parkinson's simplistically, uh, there's an imbalance, uh, normally there's a balance like the teeter-totter when you're in school between dopamine and acetylcholine. There's less dopamine than there should be, and there's relatively more acetylcholine. So you can manage Parkinson's by giving a cholinergic blocking drug, so making this side of the teeter-totter a little lighter, or making this side a little bit, uh, a little bit heavier. Um, so some of you have probably already tried anticholinergics, and for some it'll be fantastic, but we tend not to use it, use it that often. Uh, amantadine uh, was discovered by accident. It was given for flu prophylaxis, I believe it was in the 1970s, in people who were in nursing homes. Some of these people had Parkinson's, and they noted, lo and behold, these people were moving better. Uh, it has a few, I'm not going into full mechanism of actions, but it has about three or four different mechanisms of, uh, of action. Uh, it's available as a red capsule or a liquid. With the liquid, you can titrate it. The problem with the liquid is it's messy. For a while, the company wasn't making it, and so you either get a compounding pharmacy to make the pill, or they'd be traveling with the liquid, which is kind of messy. And if you have tremor or slowness, it's harder to mix it, take the syringe out, and uh, do, do that yourself. The typical starting dose is uh, one pill twice a day, so morning and noon, sometimes up to three times a day. Uh, if you have significant problems with the kidney, go back to once a day. Uh, it has a mild benefit, but for some people, that seems to be one of the better ones for them. And if it works, it tends to work quickly, so within a week or two. Uh, adverse effects, it can give you confusion, hallucinations. It can cause the lower legs to swell and be discolored. Uh, and I'll show you a slide coming up on that. I still use it occasionally. Uh, there's insufficient evidence to support the use of amantadine according to Canadian guidelines. I think that's grade B that they listed. Uh, and I had one lady and there's definite swelling and some discoloration, but it works well for her. And her quote was, I prefer function over fashion. She's okay, she's in her 70s. So I said, well, it could, and the swelling did get better when you stopped it, but she was worse. So that's an acceptable trade-off for her. It's not life-threatening, it's not doing her in, but we just acknowledge this is a side effect for, for her. This is what's called levito reticularis. Hopefully I'm not infringing on too many copyright of acknowledge this person down there. Uh, it's kind of this l lattice, like, I'm not sure if you can see too well from a, uh, kind of a modeled, uh, modeled discoloration. And typically up to the knee, sometimes above that. I've actually seen one or two people where it's in the arms. It can be asymmetric. Um, it's, it's not painful. Uh, next set of medication are called the monoamine oxidase B or MAOB inhibitors. Uh, the two ones that we have uh, currently available are sologeline or sageline. These are both irreversible inhibitors. And they work by inhibiting breakdown of dopamine in the brain. So that sounds pretty good. And they, you think, wow, that... Those should be really, really powerful medications. However, they only each have a mild symptomatic benefit. They're well tolerated, but they don't do a whole lot if you're really slow and stiff and you expect they're going to have a, a tremendous response to these drugs. They just, they don't have that same oomph. Uh, you can get what's called serotonin syndrome where people can get a, get a fever, twitchy, um, and so caution with use of um, SSRIs, which are antidepressants. Practically, it doesn't happen. There's a label, and so the pharmacy gets very excited, and sometimes I have to write on there, I am aware they are on drug X or drug Y, and it's okay to, to take it. I think I've had one person in my practice that may have had symptoms of serotonin syndrome. I just warn people up front, but unfortunately, you need to treat the physical features as well as the mood features, and if I say I'm gonna put you on this, but I'm but I need to change your antidepressant, that's worked so well for you, I don't think I'm doing them any, any favors. So safety-wise, I'm fine with using this, a number of other neurologists are fine with this, but pharmacy gets kind of excited about that. Uh, back in the 90s, there was called a data top study, and they said, selegiline is protective, and so everyone is on selegiline. 
And then they looked at the data and say, you know what, selegiline simply delays the need for symptomatic use of levodopa by nine months. Um, delays by a bit, but that's, that's not that impressive. Uh, they looked at uh, the other drug called risagiline to see if it was protective. And a number of these drugs that you'll hear read about have fantastic evidence in animal studies or cell studies. The challenge is translating that into humans and measuring things like neuroprotection in humans. That's going to be, that's going to be a bit tough. Uh, so Sledgley met three of the four endpoints, but not all of them, so it didn't justify the neuroprotection. Uh, MAOB inhibitors may be used as symptomatic treatment for, for people with early Parkinson's. Uh, there's a newer drug, and I found out about this from one of my patients who's a, a retired PhD who unfortunately had Parkinson's and would update me on the latest things that were going on. I said, oh, I better, I better look that up. So it's in contrast to being an irreversible inhibitor, it's a reversible MAOB inhibitor, so it has a similar type of action to selegiline and rosagiline. And for whatever reason, the companies decided to call it Onstreve here, and the rest of the world is called Zadigo. It was approved in Canada in January 2019. It's going through what's called a common drug review, and each province is a little different to determine if it's going to be on a provincial formulary. Uh, so it's indica the indication for this is add-on therapy for those um, on levodopa who have some wearing off. Um, talk briefly about the agonists. I've been told I have 10 minutes, so I have to um, become more or less bradykinetic and move, move a little quicker here. Most of you are familiar with the agonist, primipexol, ripinerol, or tigotine, which is a transdermal agent. They're the second most potent class of medications. They're, they're good medications. They work well, but unfortunately, uh, they have a number of side effects. They thought they were protective. They're not really protective. They thought they delayed dyskinesia, but when you do the analysis and say, from time to starting levodopa, when you get dyskinesia, it's, it's the same. Uh, sleepiness, confusion, uh, hallucinations, impulse control disorders, uh, unfortunately, can be quite devastating, and you caution people about them. There should always be someone in the room when you talk to them about impulse control disorders, and it can sneak up on people. Uh, sometimes people go from not buying any lotto tickets to buying one a week, and then it goes to one a day, uh, so I want to keep an eye on that. There's no good evidence that one's better than the other, and you can use them for uh, symptomatic early management. Uh, talk briefly about levodopa. Uh, it was discovered in 1960, or dopamine deficiency discovered in 1960. Uh, intravenous levodopa reported in 1961. There's a wonderful video of a woman that goes from being flexed over to being mo more mobile. Um, unfortunately, that was the only dose she got because they could only make enough for one. Uh, it was, was uh, English-dominated world and pre-Google Translate, so it was published in German. People didn't make a big deal out of it. And then Katsias and colleagues in New York reported on a large dose of DLDOPA and gave the equivalent of up to 30 doses of a standard regular, regular per day. So a lot of these people got dyskinesias. Uh, just for sake of time, I'll move over this. Decarboxase inhibitors inhibit peripheral catalysm. I want to mention this fellow. He was a fellow that discovered uh, dopamine deficiency. Uh, he was only, I think, 35 when this happened. He is a distinguished professor of brain disorders research in Saskatchewan for zero charge. That's about what we, we can pay, and the price is right. He's a fantastic fellow. He's still alive. He's in his 90s. He lives in Austria. Uh, and he was a Nobel nominee as well, and he should have, quite frankly, got it with the rest of them that discovered dopamine deficiency. So, nominee in 1999, but unfortunately didn't get it. Uh, that's just a pathway. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz on that. Uh, <laughs> Half-life is short. Uh, when you're comparing the CR with the regular, the bioavailability is about 30% less. So, four of the CR is equal to three of the regular. The typical starting dose is one pill three times a day. Sometimes I start people on half a pill once a day because they're really sensitive to everything. But it's different in pediatric medicine where everything is on a milligram per kilogram basis. So you can imagine that if I'm seeing a 40-year-old man with Parkinson's who's six feet, 200 pounds, one pill three times a day may not be sufficient compared to someone who's 75 years old and weighs maybe 100 pounds. So there's some people, I, I'll try and get away with as little as I can, but knowing that I'm going to have to go up. Um, just competes with protein for absorption. Uh, sometimes you need some food to get it to settle. You're familiar with some of the adverse effects for that. Big takeaway, it remains the most effective drug to manage motor symptoms. There's nothing that's going to, I don't see anything that's going to replace that. Uh, and keep the dose as low as possible. Uh, wearing off, 
people tell you, and they say the dose doesn't last as long, it's just kind of easy to maybe mild, they're moving around a little bit, their jaw's moving, they may not even be aware of it. If it doesn't bother them, just acknowledge that it's there, but I don't treat that. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that one. And I'm sure you're familiar with the difference between dyskinesias and tremor. They're kind of flowing movements. Typically the Parkinsonian features are good with that. With tremor, it's a rhythmic movement and the Parkinsonian features are worse. That's kind of a simplistic view. Sometimes people have a, uh, have a mixed picture, but that generally suffices. Um, about half of people get motor fluctuations within four to six years of treatment. And it seems that the duration of illness and dose determines development and not the duration of the therapy. So if you need it, take Lifidopa or whatever other symptomatic treatment. Uh, wearing off, take your dose sooner. That's easy enough and it goes from three to four times a day when you're getting about five times a day, not so easy. Uh, agonist, you have a longer half-life on Lifidopa. Um, and I'm not overall keen to use those much beyond uh, age 70. Uh, and you can consider agonist for management to motor complications. It gives you about two hours more off time or more on time. Uh, and tachypone inhibits peripheral breakdown. Uh, MALB inhibitors can also be used for wearing off. Each of them give you about one more hour. Um, and so those can be used. Um, and don't worry about that. Uh, just kinesias, uh, sometimes redu reducing the dose of medicine. Like if I take someone off levodopa, they're just reduce it, they're just kind of be better, but their other motor symptoms are going to be worse. So you're trying to find that, that sort of balancing act. Amantadine is the only medication you can add and that can improve dyskinesias, even in people where you've tried it before and it hasn't improved their motor functions of Parkinson's. Um, just go over off. Uh, we don't have a particular medication for gait freezing. Uh, visual cues seem to work the, the best and just being as active as you can. Uh, tremor can be tough to treat and there's a paper that shows there's a difference between people with dopa responsive tremor and those that have dopa resistant tremor. Uh, in those people that have dopa resistant tremor, there seems to be activation of the cerebellum or back part of the brain that's influencing the, the basal ganglia. Uh, you can try DBS, um, beta blockers, there has been enough talk about um, the gel, uh, which reduces off time by more than four hours. Uh, some studies, it requires a lot. It requires a neurologist, nursing care, gastroenterologist. So it's not something you just say, I'm going to. Um, have that done. I understand it's been approved in BC, but there are a limited number of cases that can be, that can be done. Uh, option for those who may not be candidates. Uh, full disclosure, I have no personal experience with using, uh, using the gel. I just, I, I would need another junior colleague to be able to help me out with, um, with that. But I think it is a, a good option for people. But you need a skilled center and experience to do that. Uh, deep brain stimulation helps both dyskinesias wearing off, and there are two sites, either the globus pallidus interna or subthalamic nucleus. Um, both of those are perfectly acceptable sites and just depends on the comfort of the surgeon. Uh, you can stimulate part of the brain called a thalamus for people that have really disabling tremor. I've had some people where they have, their balance is pretty good, their thalamus and stiffness is pretty good, but they're really shaky. So a thalamic stimulator can help, but it's not going to help with those other features. Um, and there's some limitations with that. Typically under 70, though not always, no significant cognitive or psychiatric fe features. It doesn't help with the axial symptoms. So if you're looking at improving your speech, swallowing, gait, and balance, that's not gonna be enough. It's, uh, DBS is not necessarily going to help those. And in some people, it can make the, the speech a bit worse. Uh, general rules, good rest, reasonable diet, I don't, Tell them to go one way or the other. If someone wants the odd junk food or to have the odd drink of alcohol, that's fine. Just don't have too much. Uh, big thing, physically, socially, and cognitively active. I've looked at, I'm not a physiotherapist, but pretty much all the studies I've looked at for physical therapy, they all report some benefit with Parkinson's. I haven't come across one that's been really negative. Uh, and any time you're under some other stress, that'll transiently worsen the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So if you're undergoing some uh, tough times at, uh, at home, that can make the tremor not worse. Uh, everyone's different and works best for you or someone else. It's not gonna be the same. So pill X may be great for your neighbor, but doesn't work well for you or gives you side effects. Take medications on time, but have some leeway. You're going out to a show, you have some guests over. Give yourself some wiggle room. It's probably better to take your medicine a little earlier than a little later. And when you're traveling, always have your pills available and plan for an extra day up front. 
Uh, so if you're planning on you know, a nice five-day trip, book for seven days. The first day, recover, get used to your new surroundings when you get back home. Don't have something booked. Try and um, just get back into your usual schedule. And if you can still do things, you just may not be do, able to do them quite as quickly or in quite the same, the same way. And I'm, I've got about two minutes, so I don't think I can cover any of this. It, it's tough. It's about 52 years, and trying to do that in an hour is a lot. Uh, I will touch very briefly, very, very briefly on that. Uh, so what happened was uh, Rajput Sr. started at the U of S in July 1967. Uh, he was on a one-year contract, and his department head was the only neurologist who was actually department head at that time, went away to a meeting. This was in October 67. When he was away at the meeting, he died. And then they had a new department head, and uh, Rajput Sr. said, new department head called him in and said, he was crying. He said, well, I've got one neurologist that died, another one that's going to leave, please stay here. So he said, fine, I'll give you one more year. Fortunately, his math isn't that good, it's 52 years now. <laughs> uh, the program began in 1968, basically so patients have access to levodopa, because it's a new drug that came out. He showed you that 67, there's big news from Kotzias and colleagues in New York, and saying, you can't get it unless you're a researcher. I said, okay, I'm a researcher. Uh, this is, so things changed. He met my mom in 68. They got married in May 69. His father-in-law died about six weeks later. His mother-in-law moved in. This is me sometime after October 1970. So uh, a, lot, a lot changed. And then challenges, which is not unique, but it was tough then. No money, no manpower, no machines. There was not even CT. CT didn't exist then. No cultural support for research, and he was a teacher. With no dead, so he said, you want to do it, you do it off the, the side of the table. Uh, so he decided to create material, the fourth M. And he thought, well, they looked at biochemical studies and clinical observations. He had no experience with brain biochemistry. He was a neurologist. And he's only one person. So you can imagine if you're going to report your findings, you say, I'm one neurologist. I've seen 10 cases. Fine, I'm at institution X. I've seen 50 cases or 100 cases. Who are you going to accept for publication? Who are you going to listen to? This group has got 50, they're, it's just tougher. So he decided to focus on a few other things. He still needed some money. Uh, and he collaborated with neuropathology, a very nice and excellent neuropathologist. And in the mid 70s, collaborated with Dr. Frankiewicz. This is Super 8. Uh, there was a movie of that a few, a few years ago by Spielberg. Uh, this cost several hundred dollars. So I'm guessing, I asked you know, 75, this would have cost you know, $500. In today's money, it would be like $2,500 or more. Had no sound and big and clunky. So that tells you where technology has, has come. Uh, and this was just briefly one of his first papers. It only took him 12 years to put this one out. Uh, and he just decided that, you know, people that were sent away, they had horrendous dyskinesias, and so he decided to lower the dose and said, this is, this is better, and that's the standard of care now. So this is back in 84, so ahead of its time. This one shows that we're wrong, that we think we're okay. Two-thirds of the time, we make the correct diagnosis at the first visit. By the last visit, we're right about three-quarters of the time. And there's still some people where we're not quite sure, and unfortunately, the best we can say is, this is not typical, it doesn't fit into my realm of what I know, and what we see in the officer, what someone experiences, isn't always what the brain pathology shows. We want to give someone the right answer, but sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not quite as, quite as simple. Uh, this paper was actually rejected by a journal, won the best paper of the year in uh, Canadian Journal, and interestingly, another uh, group produced the exact same numbers in a different journal, so I'll let you decide that. Uh, timely levodopa, that just basically says, if, give levodopa before someone's posture becomes unstable, so before stage three. Uh, and people you, you talk about free radicals, concern with levodopa being toxic, it's metabolized, including free radicals. Is it damaging? No. And they report on cases getting up to 24 kilogram lifetime doses. None of them had any accelerated loss. The Niagara. Uh, just difference in terms of dyskinesia and wearing off. So there's a difference actually in brain metabolism. Some people are very prone to getting dyskinesias. Some people are more prone to wearing off, meaning their pills don't last as long. 
Uh, when you actually look at the brain and do the biochemical analysis, and this is with Kornikevich, you know, very smart biochemist and scientist to do this, those that metabolize dopamine more quickly uh, tend to have more wearing off. Uh, this one likely won't be repeated, only took 39 years for this paper. Looked at people who are diagnosed with Parkinson clinically and came to autopsy. Uh, two thirds of cases had a mixed picture, slowness, stiffness, tremor, all about the same. Uh, about a quarter with slowness and stiffness predominating. And this is over the lifetime, because when you look at papers, they may just have a snapshot. This is what they were like here, but as you know, Parkinson's lifelong condition. So we wanted to say over the lifetime of the course, what was our predominant clinical picture? And those that had tremor dominant tended to be younger onset, tended to be, uh, tend to take a longer time to go to postural instability. Uh, we'll ignore that, just difference. Uh, this I'm just highlighting, I'm, I'm going as quickly as I can. I'm giving you two minutes. It, I, can, I can be quiet and answer questions. If you want me to finish up, I really have about five, five minutes left if you'll indulge me if that's okay. This was a paper, the first patient was seen back in the 80s. And you can see there's a multi-center study. I've highlighted uh, our colleagues at UBC. Uh, it's a huge family. Uh, this is kind of Mennonite, Russian, German. Uh, and he found a novel gene. This one is another novel gene. Um, and I'm showing this to you because this is someone who had onset of Parkinson's when he was 31. Or pardon me, 13. And he was first seen at 31. I looked at the chart. It's two volumes thick. And it was actually admitted to hospital before I was born. Uh, we don't have PET in Saskatoon. So he flew out to UBC to have this done here and there. We had to pay for his trip and pay for someone else to come out and attend with him to get that done. But uh, for the physicians out here, 60 years disease duration, you can still see fluorodopa uptake. That's pretty darn good. There's something very unique about this person. And this is a family B, they're from, they're from Italy. Uh, and these are, they're younger. And I think both, all three people affected had some uh, mild cognitive uh, issues. Um, so this is important, it's a novel gene that's reported. Multiple sites, UBC, our program, Oxford, Tokyo, Heidelberg, Milan. It only required 43 years to get the autopsy. And this fellow was living at home, and so he passed away. Normally we get the autopsy within 24 hours. He died about 60 hours. And the brother said, you know, he's not answering the phone, went over, he passed away, and we, we got the brain. So this is the only autopsy brain with this condition in the, uh, in the world. Uh, and we'll skip over that. There's no prion hypothesis in terms of uh, conjugal transmission. The spouse isn't going to give it to someone. Uh, it's a safety deposit, not a bank. We only accept patients from people we've seen here. And as you could tell, if you have a piece of material, whatever it is, a blood sample, brain sample, you have no clinical information. That piece is basically not very meaningful, as opposed to saying, yes, they had onset at this, they were tried on these and these drugs, this would happen to them. That's much more rich, and you can do much more with that information. We've looked at, we've worked with over 17 teams, 30 individuals. There's no cost of tissue to collaborators. We don't sell any tissue. There's no cost. Whatever I do is part of my, part of my work. We will ask for some funds to pay for the staff. We've had over 660 brain autopsies, more than 400 frozen brains, over 2,000 blood samples. We estimate the total cost from first, first visit to autopsy, about $20,000. I showed you the Super 8. Things have evolved. We now have digital cameras. We've done around 4,400 patient videos. We have 10 minus 80 freezers. Those each cost about $15,000. We're also on unpaid 24-7 call for our freezers and autopsies. So if I get a phone call and it's a 306 number and I... I can't simply ignore it and think it's someone asking for my political views. It may be a nursing home or somewhere else saying, Mr. and Mrs. Honsel passed away, they'd like to donate your brain. So I have to make sure that we get on the ball and talk to either you know, family, nurses, a funeral home, and so forth. Uh, there's no cost to the patients or families for that. That's, our, that's a cart. We don't have a fixed area. We have to take the cart down to uh, the clinic space. That's uh, surely someone who used to work there many years ago, frozen brain. Those are uh, freezers, and those are, we had VHS tapes. The one, see this one is, those are formalin brains we now have, those are slides, and those are the VHS tapes. Now they're not so many because we don't use VHS anymore. Uh, those are home numbers there. Uh, remember if you're calling, it's a 306 area code, not 639. Um, that's a declaration for desire. You can will anything to someone, but you can't will their brain. So it has to be done by next of kin. And we've had instances where the family says, uh, 
no, I'm sorry, or the next of kin says, I can't do this because all these other people don't want to donate mom or dad's brain, and you just say, fine, that's, that's okay. Uh, it works because there are a lot of people that we can't pay enough to. Uh, research staff, health authority, especially maintenance staff, and we hold an annual thank you dinner to them because they go and they check our freezer, they tell us which is the best freezer to, to get. Uh, we, it doesn't work without them. Our colleagues in pathology, patients and families, uh, and not a, without a lot of please and thank yous. Like if we have to pay for all the work that they do, plus have to pay for space, plus have to pay for the electricity, you couldn't run it. And we've had people from programs worldwide that have come here and said, this is what we do. It's not like Colonel Sanders' trade secret. This is it. And they've all said, we, we can't do it. So um, we've had uh, two sources of, two major sources of funding, golf and curling. They were done, interestingly, in Regina. Uh, Saskatoon is about 150 miles north of Regina, and they have kindly donated a lot. Unfortunately, those have wound up. Uh, anonymous $1 million donation to start the endowment, another $600,000 donation by the same source. A fellow by the name of uh, Mr. Joseph Remy, uh, his family, the art gallery, the new art gallery in Saskatoon is named after them. He has donated 600000 over the past couple of years. And we pay for all the employees. Their annual budget's about 300000 and the, what's covered for the government pays for about a third, so we need to do that. Uh, we need another movement disorders neurologist. I'm the, I'm the latest recruit, and I've been there for 20 years, so I would very much like someone to help uh, if anyone wants, and there are lots of people to thank, and thank you kindly for indulging me as I went over time, and it looks like you're still awake. So thank you, Dr. Rajput, and uh, um, yay to little Saskatoon. I mean, that's uh, pretty incredible. We've been trying to get a brain bank here for many years, and as you said, uh, uh, I know we've had our researchers go to your brain bank and you've been very generous in sharing samples. So thank you for, for making that happen as well. So we do have a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, Stacy over there will take yours first. Hi there. Hi. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. I was just wondering how you're prescribing exercise to people. You were saying lifestyle management yeah. is difficult. I I have not written a prescription for uh, exercise per se. There's an exercise program at the field house, which is just across, uh, just across on campus. A number of people will, will go there. Uh, early on, I haven't tended to write, you know, physiotherapy is needed. I will send them when appropriate, but that's an interesting thought. And if you're to look at, uh, I mean, it's sort of beyond the scope of the topic, but looking at the benefit of exercise, I think, you're probably going to get much more out of writing exercise than for medication. If a pill did what all of exercise did in terms of what I've seen for uh, sort of protection, maintaining function, everyone would, everyone would be on it. That's, that's what I've, and I was looking at things, what are, they had some acupuncture, the not sure acupuncture really, there's some questionable in ter terms of uh, animal work. They did uh, Pilates, they've done, and every exercise works, but it seems that those benefits are only for that specific thing. If it's strength, it's going to be strength, it's better, it's not necessarily going to improve a lot of your balance, improve a lot of other activities. So I think regardless if it's going to be dancing, boxing, whatever, whatever else, I tell them be as active as you can, be as safe as you can, and you have to like what you're doing. You can't just say, well, I'm gonna do this, and I really hate it. Nobody's gonna do what they, what they don't like. Yeah, because we know that exercise does have neuroprotection. There's lots of animal studies and going into human studies. And there's lots more physiotherapists that specialize in exercise I, therapy. And wonderful. So it'd be great if we could use it as a medicine for exercise prescription. Now, how, how would, I'm just... <laughs> I, how, would, how would that work? I'm just curious, how would that work? Would it just be writing a prescription and... Like if I wanted to do that and if I were here, how, how would that work in terms of coverage and for what the... Can I intervene know? here? Because what we're suggesting, because uh, we've only had uh, one case where someone has successfully gotten it through as a, a healthcare cost on their tax return. Uh, what we are suggesting uh, as a society is that you have the doctor uh, indicate the frequency and the duration and a little bit about the type of exercise that might be helpful on a prescription sheet for you. Um, and uh, um, 
then keep all your receipts and put it in as part of your uh, health care costs or your tax return. We've not had a second person come to us yet uh, with all of that in place uh, so that we could again uh, take it to the tax courts. I have uh, every, have sorry, I have every one of my members in my exercise class submit it through extended benefits and receive receipts. You're a physiotherapist, so it's a little, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So we have another question at the back. Amy? In uh, the neurologist Eric Arskog at the Mayo Clinic wrote in his 2009 monograph that give as much L-DOPA as you need. But I got the impression from your slides that L-DOPA will burn out the neurons. Uh, you you take as much take as much as you as much as you need uh, for that. It, you, the practice used to be that they would actually uh, give they would give enough levodopa till someone became dyskinetic, and then taper taper them down. We give as much as someone as someone needs. Now, if they need enough to improve their slowness of stiffness and they they have mild non bothersome dyskinesias, uh, that's that's fine. Uh, the upper limit. Technically, it's probably about 20 pills a day. I have some people who are on more than that because they just, they frankly need it. I prefer not to. Most of the people I say, you know, they're on three pills and they are worried about going up to six. I say most people are on anywhere from about three to 12, but as the disease progresses, they'll need more. There's no evidence that you're damaging the brain by giving them more, but if I'm giving people a lot of levodopa, especially early on, I know that I'm more likely to give them dyskinesias. Yes. Yeah. Many people with Parkinson's lose weight as the mm -hmm. Parkinson's progresses. Were you implying then that people should be dropping back their levodopa dosage with that? Because you made a, a weight relationship uh, there. Well, the, that's a, I said that's a good point. In terms, if someone's, if they're on the same amount of medication and relatively their weight has gone down by, you know, 20%, I may now see mild dyskinesia become more bothersome or more, or more obvious. Uh, I wouldn't suggest necessarily dropping it I'm, because the flip side of that is if I reduce the levodopa, then someone may get more slow and stiff. So I'm, it's going to depend on okay. the, the individual. And ideally, you'd say, how, how can we get you to maintain your weight? Because we do know that people with Parkinson's lose weight. Maybe they send them to dietitian, nutritionist, get them to have Ensure. But you, you're, you're right. It's uh, people with, on a milligram per kilogram basis, the more you take, the more likely you are to get dyskinesias. So you don't necessarily prescribe according to people's weights? Uh, I, I don't, yeah. well, we try and yeah. take away, and it's sort of a, uh, I'm saying a gestalt with that. I had someone, a, a young, or young to middle-aged woman who was like 5, 10, and 200 pounds and was, had moderate dyskinesias on the equivalent of less than six pills per day, and it hadn't been on it that long. And I'm wondering, there's something different about her metabolism. I wouldn't have expected that. So I've seen enough people that I know there's what I would expect, and then there are a number of, of outliers, and I adapt to that, uh, that individual. No rules. <laughs> they're, well, they're, they're, I should say that there are guidelines, but you have, to be, you, you have to be free to adapt and do what's best for, for that individual, even if it doesn't go by the common dogma. Okay, I think we have time for only one more question. I see Amy at the back there. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that keep the dose as low as possible. Mm -hmm. If we have, I've taken Cinemet for the last seven years, and I have felt myself that it has not benefited me at all in terms of reducing my uh, tremors, is there a danger in stopping taking it altogether? Uh, if you're looking at stopping that, Medication, I would, uh, for anyone, I would advise against it unless you, you speak to your uh, speak to your physician or whoever your healthcare provider is. There are times when people are on a medicine, and they say, "I don't think it works," and then you say, "Well, let's find a way how we can gradually decrease it." And maybe the drug doesn't work, or maybe you get to a certain level, and they say, "Gosh, I didn't think it worked, but now this other symptom is so much uh, is so much worse, and I need to go. I need to go back on it." But suddenly withdrawing medications is just it is not a good idea, regardless of Parkinson medicine. So thank you again, Dr. Rajput. That was a lot of information, and I really appreciate you uh, squeezing it all in. So thank you again for joining thank, us thank today. You.